we've been in this series I'll call it vision, and really in the beginning, uh, I'd say uh, qu- uh, last quarter uh, of 2023, God really began to drop vision in my heart, the word, kind of the concept, also really giving me scriptures on it, and I, I just felt like it would be a good time to teach and talk about vision as we get into 2024. This, this, the text for the whole series is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 7. It says, uh, we walk by faith. We, uh, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. We're talking about vision, and you may say, oh, what does that mean right there? Scripture says that we don't walk by sight. Then why are we talking about vision? Well, uh, the godly vision that we're talking about is not through our natural eyes. It's through faith that we, even though something may be as it is, we don't see it as it is. We walk by faith and we see as what it could be. And so our heart is that we would build our lives around our faith and see things the way that God has called us to. And so we're super excited about all God has called us to. In Proverbs chapter 29, in verse 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, this text doesn't mean if someone doesn't have vision, they're going to die. That's not what this text means. This text means, let me explain, it means uh, if if we don't have vision, we're going to end up just wandering. And what's going to happen is if we don't have vision, then what we're going to end up doing is we're just going to end up making our own decisions. We're going to end up leading the way. We're going to end up just choosing different things based on our feelings, based on our own uh, uh, wisdom, on our own understanding. And how many of you know when you make your own decisions and you lead the way, it usually leads to a life that's not so healthy? And so what we, this scripture is saying here, that's what it does. When we leave, we, live with our, we have no vision, we lead with our own lives, it ends in destruction. It leads to regret and to shame and to guilt. And so we have to have vision, godly vision, and what God has called us to. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 2, it says this, And the Lord answered me, write the vision and make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. And for still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come and it will not delay. The scripture says that the Lord told him, write the vision down and make it plain. Last week we talked about how really vision is birthed in the void and really embracing the void of our lives and finding vision from those areas. Today I want to talk to you about the obstacles and overcoming the obstacles of vision, overcoming the obstacles of vision. We can want to live the way God wants us to. We can, have a, we, des- we can have a heart that desires to be close to the Lord. We can have a heart that desires to have a healthy relationship with our spouse or our, our girlfriend or boyfriend or our fiance. We can desire to have a healthy relationship in our workplace. We can desire to have uh, a healthy um, uh, lifestyle and the way that we choose to live our lives. We can desire these things, but as we desire these things, there can be obstacles that get in the way. And oftentimes these obstacles can cause us to lose passion or motivation to continue to do what it is we have vision for. So let's say you, you want a healthy marriage, you get passionate about it beginning of the year, maybe you, you, want, to, you want to have a healthy relationship with your, with your coworkers at the beginning of the year, you're excited, whatever it may be, we get passionate about it. But then over time, through just life and through obstacles that happen, we can start losing motivation and passion, and then we end up being stuck. It's a lot oftentimes how our relationships with God are. We, ha- we start with this concept that we desire to be close to Him. We desire to pursue Him. We desire to know Him. And then through the course of just life, we end up slacking. And next thing you know, now we say, well, we just don't have time, or we just, we're just too busy, or we just, you know, whatever it may be, And so God wants us to be able to overcome the obstacles so that we can really reach the vision that he has for us in our lives. Does that make sense? In James chapter 4 and verse 8, the scripture says that draw close to the Lord or draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Draw near to God and God will draw near to you. The scripture also says, Jesus talks about it in John chapter 15 verse 4, abide in me and I in you. And as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
Apart from me, you can do nothing. Here is the interesting thing. The scripture says that if we draw near to God and he draws near to us, then he draws near to us. The scripture says here, Jesus says, abide in me because without him, we can do nothing. Interesting because the scripture also says that God will never leave us. The scripture says that God will never forsake us. So wait a minute here. If God will never leave us and God will never forsake us, then what is this text saying in James where if we draw near to him, he'll draw near to us. I thought he was already with us. He is. But James is showing us a picture of this this incredible opportunity for us to have a close relationship with him, a closer, more intimate relationship with him. And all we have to do is draw near to him. He'll he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll always love you. Yes. But it's also the the, the thought of we get uh, the incredible gift of being close to him when we draw near to him, abiding in him and remaining in him when we draw close to him. And so it shows me this, that proximity is so important to determine our vision in our lives. Proximity is what determines our vision. We have to be close to be able to really see. What we're close to is oftentimes what we see most. If we're not close to someone or something, it's easier for me to see somebody in the front row than it is for me to see someone in the back row. Why? Because they're closer. It's the same thing with God. As we're close with him, it's easy for us to see the things that he wants me to see. But if we're far from him in our own lifestyle and our own situations, here's what happens. Now, I'm starting to see things my own way or the way that I think they should be, and it could cause us to lose the heart that God wants us to have. That's why it's so important that we would draw near to him and abide in him Why? Because the scripture says, apart from him, we can do nothing. Apart from him, we can have no vision, no healthy vision. Apart from him, we can not bear the fruit, not bear the fruit that he desires for us to bear. And it's interesting because oftentimes human nature, what we say is closeness is is a time frame. We oftentimes, as, as humans, human nature is, well, someone's been married for 30 years. Well, they're close. Well, somebody's been friends for 20 years. Well, they're close. Well, somebody's been uh, uh, co-workers for, for 15 years. They're close. Their time frame is what makes them close, but that's not true at all. How many of you know? You know somebody that's been married for a long time and they're not close. How many of you know you have friends that you've known since a long time ago and you just you, you know them and maybe you're, you're Facebook friends with them, but you're not close. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so it's not just necessarily our time frame. It's the same thing with the Lord. Just because someone's been a Christian since they were five years old does not mean that they're closer than you are who's only been serving the Lord for five weeks. Why? This is the incredible thing about the Lord God we serve. Proximity is, is I draw close to him. It's not a time frame. It's a heart posture. It's a pursuit. And so my pursuit is I want to I want to I want to draw close to him and I and then he draws close to me. It's not a time frame. It's not about how long we've been reading the Bible. In fact, I'll say this, maybe you're in the room or online and maybe you're far from him. I want to encourage you it, abiding in him and knowing him. It it's, it can start today. Abiding isn't this process that we have 15 years down the road. No, it starts today. It's committing your life to him, confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that Jesus is Lord. And the Bible says that now you are abiding in him, your relationship with him. And this is where we start the pursuit of drawing close to him. Does that make sense? It's not a time frame. Just a couple uh, months ago, uh, we were doing one of our membership meals. And a uh, membership meal, my, my, my mic is going crazy here. Let me try to fix it here. But we were doing a membership meal. And if you don't know, we do membership meals here. What is that? We do next steps. And next steps is uh, uh, our process to really become a member. You get to know who we are. We get to know a little bit about you. And then uh, you get to know kind of how we get in, how you can get involved and serve in the church. Because we believe in being a church uh, that isn't just a come and leave. But we, being a, we believe in being a church that serves one another. And then the third week is, is our membership meal. It's really where we sit together. Uh, my wife and I sit with those uh, that are becoming members and we just, we just hang out. We just chat and we talk. Well, we had a couple months ago, we had a young college girl, freshman who was coming in and she was just passionate. She was hyped. Okay. And so she's talking to me about her best friend. Okay. And I'm going to try to do this. Y'all don't make me laugh, but I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to, and I'm not making fun of her. I actually think she's an incredible young lady, but I'm going to try to imitate 
the, the conversation that we had. Okay, and y'all be serious because this is don't don't make me laugh. Okay, I'm gonna try to imitate, show you the process of what I was walking through in our membership meal just a few months ago. So I'm talking to this young lady. Uh, tell me how you heard about the church. Give me a little bit, and she says, "Oh, Pastor Jordan." Wait, 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 wait! Don't make me laugh. Don't make me laugh. Pastor Jordan, let me tell you the story. This is so cool. My friend, my best friend, she came one week before me. And my best friend, we love all the same things. She eats the things that she eats and I love them. She, the, things, the places she goes, I love them. The things that she watches, I love them. So I knew Pastor Jordan. I knew that when she came to this church and loved it, oh my gosh, I knew I was gonna love it. So I'm thinking, oh my goodness. These, these, these girls have been friends since they were born. Like they must, they must be like best friends for life. I said, wow, it's a very cool. I said, so did y'all grow up together? And she says, oh no, Pastor Jordan, we met three months ago. <laughs> okay. Now here's the thing, I'm being funny and I love them, but here's the thing. It's interesting because oftentimes we think, again, human nature thinks my closeness means I have to have known or done something for thousands and hundreds or however many years. And that's not the case at all. Closeness is a pursuit of one another if in your marriage. You can be close in your marriage. Maybe you're far in your marriage and guess what? You wanna come back. All it is is a pursuit of one another and you can be close again. It's the same thing with God. Maybe you're far from him. All it is is a pursuit of being close and now you can draw near and he draws near to you. It's a pursuit. It's not a time frame. And so it's important that we understand this because we can think proximity can be an obstacle. So here's what happens. The enemy will use it as now because I don't feel close or because I haven't prayed in a while or because I'm just getting back into church or because I haven't really gone to a small group or because I haven't read my Bible consistently. Now I'm not close to God. Well, hold on a second, hold on a second. Now what we're saying is, we're saying by the things that we do or the things that we've said or the things that other people are doing is what creates my feeling of being close or not. Our closeness is, is our pursuit of him and saying, God, it's not what I've done in the past. It's about my heart today. And if I draw close today, he draws close to me. Does that make sense? It's so important that we understand this because the enemy will use proximity as an obstacle to keep us from really pursuing the vision that God has for us and being the people that God's called us to be in and having the relationships God wants us to have. Scripture says in Genesis chapter 37, this is the story of Joseph. Many of you may know this story. Uh, he was a young man uh, who his father loved. He gave him a coat of many colors, the Scripture says. And the Scripture picks up right here in verse 5 where Joseph has a dream. It says, he told his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We, are binding sheep. we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what they had said. Check out verse nine. Then he had another dream. So he told his brothers, my man wasn't the smartest tool in the shed. Come on, somebody. I know that's not the phrase, but I'm saying it that way. My man has a dream. He's like, hey, bros, check my dream out. And his brother's like, I hate you. <laughs> so then my man goes back to sleep, has another dream. And so he says, hey, bros, let me give you number two. The scripture says in verse nine, it says that they had a dream, told his brothers, listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his, brother, his father rebuked him and said, what is the dream you had? Will your father, oh, your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? Joseph has this dream, this vision that he has from the Lord. In fact, we see in the text m many years later, this dream comes to pass. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it's interesting because Joseph, he goes to his brothers and it's, it's almost like he's excited, yes, passionate, yes, but it's almost like he has a little bit of pride. He says, let me tell you what the dream that I had that y'all were gonna bow down 
And then, then he says, I had another dream, and the sun and the moon were bowing down. And it, it, it's, a, it's a concept of this. We're, we're talking about obstacles of vision. One of the obstacles, one of the greatest obstacles of vision, a have, healthy, godly vision, is pride. Pride distorts vision. What it does is this. Pride takes the reason or the purpose of vision and it, off of what God wants us to do, and it makes vision about us. Pride makes vision about my success. Pride makes vision about my, my influence. Pride makes influence about my, my, my wealth or my, my doings and my talents and my skills. And so it shifts or distorts the perspective on instead of where I'm doing it uh, for the glory of God because we really read the text. The scripture says later, that this very vision comes to pass. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but it's not just that it comes to pass. The, the, the part that came to pass wasn't necessarily God showing him that your brothers are gonna bow down to you. It was that the vision came to pass that God, he, God was gonna use him to save his brothers and a nation. But his pride got dis, distorted the vision and he made it about me. Listen to what I'm going to do and what y'all are gonna do. And pride, hear me, pride can cause us very quickly to lose the vision that God has and why we're doing what we're doing and we change it and we make it about us. We can have vision to have success in our workplaces. We can have vision to be successful in our schools and have a good education. We can have vision to have a healthy relationship with God. We can have vision to be an influence, to be a light. But here's the question, those influence, I mean, those, those visions are great, but here's the question that we have to ask ourselves. Why do we want this? Why is it that we want the influence? Why is it that we want the education? Why is it that we want the success in the workplace? Because it quickly can show us, if we evaluate that, it can quickly can show us if our pride is what is leading or driving us in this situation. I'll say it this way. The greatest enemy of our lives already lives inside of us, and it's called ego. Our greatest enemy. And you're like, oh, what are you talking about? The greatest enemy is the devil. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm gonna, sometimes when you're fighting with your spouse and you think you're right and you think that you don't need to apologize, Lucifer's nowhere near you. That's your pride. Uh, when you're fighting with your friend because your friend stole your boyfriend, more than likely Lucifer wasn't a part of that situation. You just got some pride and you're territorial. We'll move on. But here's the thing. Oftentimes, this is what we do. We, we can shift the blame because this is what always happens. If we blame, I talked about it last week. If we can blame something else, we take the responsibility off of us and we put it on somebody else. So now we can justify why we're doing what we're doing. And so it's important. No, I, I'm not going to have pride. I don't, I don't want to have an ego. I want my pride to die. Why? Because the scripture says, I'll read it to you in James chapter 4 and verse 6. He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. God is one who resists. And it's such an obstacle, hear me, of godly vision. Why? Because we make it about us. And then when we make it about us, here's what happens. Now, God can't really use us the way that he desires because it's all about us. Pride. I'll say it this way. I wrote it down. Pride's really the place where our vision is self-centered, our talents become our identities, and our accomplishments become our worth. Our ego is where our vision becomes self-centered, our talents become our identity and our accomplishments become our worth. Now, when I do something successful, now I feel successful. Or now when I have talents, now I'm known for my giftings and my talents. And so this is how people see me. And so now this is the platform that I stand on, the influence that I have. And so now people praise us for these things. And we are living in a society, honestly, that does nothing other than just encourage ego. I mean, we live in a society that literally it's, it's, it's consumed with encouraging one another to have egos. I mean, that's all social networks are nowadays. 
It's like, let's post the things that we're getting to do and let's post the things that we're, and those things are not bad. I'm not, I'm not making fun of, I'm not saying to post something, to post all the things you, you do that are bad. That's not what I'm saying. It's, it's fine to post things you like, but it's, I'm just saying we're living in a society that is consumed with puffing up our ego. And if we're not careful, we can bring that into our vision with God. And so now we're just doing things to puff our own selves up. Does that make sense? So important. Genesis chapter 37 and verse 18, it says, when Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance and as he approached them, they made plans to kill him. My man, my man had some brothers, you know what I'm saying? True bros, you know what I'm saying? Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal had eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. When Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into the empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. We skip down to verse 26 for the sake of time, and it says, Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We'd have to cover up the crime instead of hurting them. Let's sell him to these Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed, so when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver, and the traders took him to Egypt. Here's what's happening. Joseph's brother sees him coming, so let's kill this dude. Instead of killing him, they throw him into a cistern, a pit, if you will, and as he's in the pit, they say, you know what, let's just leave him there. And then as they're leaving him there, they see these Ishmaelite traders, these slave traders is what they were, walking by. And he says, hey, when they, let, let's sell him to these slave traders and then we don't have to deal with it. So they sell him for 20 pieces of silver to these slave traders and Joseph is taken off to Egypt as a slave. Can you imagine Joseph? Could you imagine being chained hand and foot, walking to Egypt, knowing your brothers just sold you? to be a slave for the rest of your life. Can't imagine the pain and the betrayal that he was feeling. What does this show us? It shows me this. I believe this with obstacles that we need to overcome in our vision is vision. It's so important that we understand that pain, it damages our vision. It can damage our vision. Here's what happens. Joseph has this dream this vision that he feels like God has given him for the future. And then all of a sudden, he's not living in the palace. Now he's a slave, sold by his own brothers. And here's what happens. We've all been in a place, all of us, every human, we've been in a place where we've been hurt by someone in our workplace, a family member, a, 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 a churchgoer, a pastor, there's so many different things and so many different people uh, that have been hurt from so many different areas. And I, I will say this, that oftentimes if we're not careful, we can allow our pain to damage the vision that God has for us. And we'll say things like this, I just never bit of love again. We say things like, well, yeah, you know what? I just, the small group thing's not for me because I joined a small group many years ago and I got caught up and, and I shared my secrets and then my secrets got out and everybody was talking bad about me and calling me all these names. And, and so that, that's not really for me. And so I just, I just can't do that. And so what can happen is we, instead of seeing the vision of God desires for us to grow, here's what happens. It, it damages our vision and it causes us to be stuck in our pain. And so everything then we see through life through the lens of our pain. You ever known someone who's been hurt by someone years ago and they're, they're still responding through that pain years and years later? And I'm not making fun of the people. That's not what I'm doing. Pain is a process. Healing is a process. There's no, no, no question about it. But we can't allow ourselves to get stuck where we don't allow ourselves to continue to be healed so that we can continue to be the people God has called us to be and also do the things God has called us to do. You may have been hurt by a parent. You may have been hurt by someone at church. You may have been hurt by a relationship. You may have been hurt by a spouse. I don't know what the hurt is, but I know we've all been hurt. But are we at the place of maturity 
where we can say, okay, God, I want to I want to walk with you and desire to be healed. So as I walk with you to pursue what you're calling me to do and be, God, I know you're going to continue to heal me. Because I can say this, we've all been hurt, but ain't none of us been sold like Jay, by their own brothers to Egypt. I can't imagine walking off. He's got his hands chained up. He's walking up. He's watching. He's seeing his brothers watch him walk off, knowing that they just earned 20 pieces of silver for his life. And it's interesting. I love this. I love this. I love this. I love this. I want to encourage people that maybe I'm walking even now in pain. I love in the text. I'm going to go back for you, uh, Josh. The scripture says in verse, uh, uh, verse 19, it says, here comes the dreamer. Verse 20, come on, let us, let's kill him and throw into one of these cisterns. Check this out. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dream. I love this. Why? Because even pain can't keep you from what God has for you in your future and his future for you. They said, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna create the pain. I'm gonna cause pain. And then we'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see how this dude does. We'll see how he makes it. But isn't it interesting that God actually used the pain to get him to the place to reach the vision that God called him to? And so I wanna encourage you if you're walking through or you have walked through a process of pain in your life, one, I believe part of God's process of, of his vision, part of the process is healing in our lives. But then two, I believe God wants to use it for what he's called us to in our future if we allow him to. The divorce that you've walked through is not in vain. The pain that you walk through in a relationship of being broken up with or the pain that, of someone betraying you at your workplace or the pain of a family or a parent treating you wrong is not in vain if we allow God to use it. Why? Because he wants to turn everything around for his glory. And this is the vision he has for us, but he doesn't want to just use it. He also wants to heal us in that process as we walk with him. Does that make sense? I didn't tell the first service that, so y'all got a freebie. There it is. Genesis chapter 39 and verse 19, it says Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated him, treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. He has this vision, this, 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 this concept of where and how and who he believes God wants him to be, and he has to walk through some pride. He has to overcome pride. Then he has to overcome this pain. But then, he, he, it's interesting, he has this vision of what God wants, but it doesn't get better. It gets worse. He then goes into being in prison. And what does this show me? Prison, I wrote this down. Prison, yeah, I gotta write it down. Prison uh, damages, pain damages, and then prison diminishes vision. Thank you. Prison diminishes vision, meaning this. We can't see past the bars, and what we're walking through. I can't tell, me, tell you how many people I've walked with in life and they said, oh no, I, this is just my personality. This is just who I am. Oh, you know, I, 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 I just get angry. I'm working on it, but I'm just an angry person. Oh no, that's just my personality. It's just, that's just who I am. It's just part of my nature. And so I just, it's just, it is what it is. I'm just, I, I just gossip. Like it's just part of who I am. Like I know it's not necessarily the healthiest thing, but it's just part of what I do. It is what it is. And I can't tell you how many people I've heard and talked with. Oh, I just get stressed. I'm just a person that worries. I'm just, they'll say, they'll even claim it over their lives. Oh, I'm just a worrier. Don't worry about me. Well, what are we doing? Here's what we're doing now. What we're doing is we're allowing ourselves to never see past the bars that we've either put ourselves in or someone else has put us in. And here's the thing I love about God. God desires for us to walk in freedom. And it's interesting that Joseph would have remained in prison. If you read the text later, please go on and read it. If you read, if you read the text, Joseph would have remained in prison unless one person would not have helped Joseph get out of prison. I'm gonna plug small groups. This is why small groups are so important because there are prisons in our lives, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, that we, we are walking in and through that we'll never get out of if we don't have people around us helping us and encouraging us and pulling us out of those areas. This is why small groups are so important. We do not do small groups just to give you something else to do. Oh my gosh, we know everybody is overly busy. 
We understand that. But we also understand the importance of the growth and development of our spiritual walk with God and in our freedom in Him. And I'm telling you, there are some freedoms that we will never reach without the help of others in our lives. And this is why it's important that we get around people that we are believing the same things, that, that are pursuing the same things, that are desiring the same things so that we can continue to be the people God has called us to be. And it's interesting that Joseph's vision that he had, that God had for him, he, ne- he did not receive or he did not get while he was in prison. He received it when he got out of prison. I believe this. There are some things that God has put in our hearts that we will do one day or that you will become, do whatever it may be. But I believe God's put dreams and visions in our hearts. But there are things that have trapped us in the now that God's wanting us to work on to get free from so that when we get to the place of where he's calling us to, we'll be walking in freedom and be able to maintain and sustain where he's called us to be. Does that make sense? And it's so important we understand this. I'm gonna close and I promise. We're talking about obstacles. Genesis chapter 41 and verse 37. Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or as wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court and all my people and will take orders from you. They'll all take orders from you. Only I sitting on my throne will have a higher rank than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of my entire land. Interesting. Joseph has this this vision. He's got to work through the obstacles of pride, of pain, of prison. But then he gets, interesting, he gets this position of second in command over all of Israel. And yet he had still not seen the vision come to pass. The vision had still not come to pass. His brothers had still not come and needed his help. And so it's interesting that he had to even get over the obstacle of power. He got the position of power, but he still had to even overcome that. Let me explain why. Because power will devalue vision. Meaning this, it'll get us to think, well, vision's not necessary. My marriage is pretty good. We don't need any more vision. We're good. I have, my, I have my sight set on my education and what I'm going for, and so it's all good. I'm just gonna follow the track. My relationship with God, you know, it's, it's decent. We're working on it, and so it's pretty good, and so I'm good. And what'll happen is it'll cause us to devalue the vision. So here's what happens when we devalue vision. We start to coast. And when we coast, here's what happens. Then we miss some of the things God's wanting to do in us and through us because we're just coasting. And I love it. Joseph didn't just say, oh man, I'm second in command. Can you imagine? I'm sure he thought about those moments where he's in chains and he's walking off thinking his life is over, wondering, God, why in the world would you give me this vision? And yet here I am walking away as a slave. And now he sits back and he's in the kingdom. I can't imagine thinking the process that he had of thinking, oh my goodness. Now I'm in second in command of an entire nation. But I love it that Joseph didn't stop. He didn't just coast. No, in fact, the Bible says Joseph went to work, if you read the scripture, because of the famine that was going to happen in Israel. And then after this, this is when we see Joseph's brothers then come. But it's interesting. He didn't allow himself just to coast because of the position of power that he received. And so this is an obstacle. Why? Because here's what we do. We get comfortable where we are. Oh, you know what? I've been going to a small group or, oh, I've been reading my Bible pretty consistently. Oh, I've been praying okay. Oh yeah, well, I'm, my marriage is pretty decent. Oh yeah, we've been married for 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, however many. Yeah, and so we're pretty good. And, we, and, and what can happen is we can coast. But the problem again about coasting is then we can miss what it is. God's trying to continue to do in us and through us. It's like this church. We're coming up, I told you, coming up on our fifth year anniversary just a couple of weeks from now and as a church. And five years ago, before we were uh, ever a church and we were practicing setting up at Leon High School and uh, we, were, we were tear down, break down, up down, up down, uh, uh, church. 
You could have told me, you know what? Well, in five years, you know, you're gonna have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people coming to the church and, and you're gonna have to have multiple services and you're not gonna have enough kids space and you're not, not gonna have enough parking and, and all these different things. And then what can happen is I can look back at the five and thinking, man, I just was hoping somebody would show up. Like I, I, I was just praying God, just, just somebody come listen to me say something. You know what I'm saying? But now we could sit back as a church and say, man, God's been good. Wow, look at all the people. One of our prayers was that God, we would be a multicultural, multi-generational church. And God, wow, you're answering our prayers. Now people come and they tell me, I can't believe how many different generations and how many different cultures are part of this church. And we could sit back and say, man, God is good. We made it. We did it. Now we can just coast for the next 30 years. But that's not what I believe our church is called to. Why? Because I believe God's called us to continue to be a light in our community. That there are hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people in our region that need to see the love of Jesus that need to see a hope and a healing in a home, that need to see a church that's willing to say, we don't care what our differences are. We don't care what our ages are. We desire to unify together to say one thing, Jesus is Lord. And so this is what we're gonna do. We're not gonna coast. We're gonna continue to pursue the vision God has for us. Why? Because we desire not to bring glory to my name. I could care less if anybody knows my name. In fact, I hope you don't know my name. I hope you come up to me in Walmart and say, oh yeah, you're the preacher of that church. What's your name? I hope that happens. Why? Because I don't want the glory. I want Jesus to get the glory. I don't want our organization to get the glory. I don't want people to say experience church. I want people to say Jesus. Why? Because he is the hope of the world and we as a church get the privilege of being a part of the vision that he has given us as a church collectively to be a light to our community and our world. So let's not coast. Let's say, oh, baby, it's about to just get started. Come on, somebody. We're not even at five years yet. I got a whole message for y'all later. You know what I'm saying? But I'm passionate about this. Why? Because it's so easy to just coast and we look around and say, oh yeah, they got the worship down. Oh yeah, they they got the greeting down. Come on, somebody with our greeters in the 45 below degree weather out there. They praise God, we're praying for them today. Oh, they got the parking lot down. They got the kids ministry down. Oh, they got it all set. And so now I can just come and I can just receive. No, we wanna be a church where we all come and we all serve. Why? Because we know as we serve and we be the hands and feet of Jesus, we're able to share the love and light of Jesus to those that are far from him and don't know him. This is the hope, hope of the world. It's Jesus. So I wanna challenge you. I don't know what obstacle it is in your life that may be keeping you or hindering you from reaching and pursuing the vision God has for you. Maybe it's proximity. Maybe it's that you've been far from him and you've strayed away or maybe you've never given your life to him. It's okay. He loves you. Maybe it's pain. Maybe it's you've walked through something so hurtful in your heart that you've not been able to get past that and and you desire God to heal you. Maybe it's pride of where you've just been saying, you know, it's it's been about me or maybe it's a prison in your life and you've you've been just walking with it stuck in this situation in your life and I believe God wants to free you from that. Or maybe it's a position of power of where you've been doing well, life is good and you're sitting in a place and you're just able to coast. I don't know what the obstacle may be for you, but I do know this. I do know that God has called all of us to overcome the obstacles that will keep us from the vision that he has for each one of us to be the people that he's called us to be and do the things that he's called us to do. Amen. Would you stand with me as we pray today? God, I thank you so much.